Christy Conlon, Managing Editor for Northlight Art Books. I'm here today with Serena Barton, who is the author of our recent release, Wabi Sabi Art Workshop. Serena has been in town this week to record two fabulous DVDs, which will be available for purchase soon. And before we let Serena return back to her hometown of Portland, Oregon, there's a few burning questions I wanted to discuss with her. Serena, I feel really lucky to be the editor for your DVDs, but I was also lucky enough to be the editor on your book. So I feel like we go way back. We do. And um, you've told me some stories, and there's some stories that are included in your book that uh, I thought we should share with our audience today. Um, and the first question I have for you, or the first story I'd like you to share with us, doesn't necessarily speak to your career in art, but I feel that it tells us a lot about you as a person. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could tell our viewers what it was that you wanted to be when you were a little girl. Okay, well, I, uh, I think the first real career that I remember uh, really wanting to have was uh, I wanted to be a queen. I read lots of fairy tales and uh, listened to Walt Disney fairy tales on my little record player and I think I thought being a queen would mean that I could wear really pretty clothes and people would have Why to not? do what I said and so it sounded like a good deal to me. I think that must be what I want to be also then. Right, <laughs> right. I think we all secretly do. So what happens to that great career aspiration? You told your parents and it was a certain time era that you were influenced oh, by. Yes, yes. Well, um, I was five years old when Queen Elizabeth II was, uh, ascended the throne and was crowned. And so that was, I guess, in the news on the radio. We didn't have TV, but we had news on the radio. And I looked at magazines and she was a very beautiful young woman at the time. And I just thought she was about as glamorous as you could get. And some, uh, somehow I had the idea that that uh, we almost knew each other. And so <laughs> I thought that I should be able to go to the coronation. For one thing, she, had a, she was gonna ride in a coach that looked just like Cinderella's coach. And so I knew that the coronation of Queen Elizabeth was the place to be, and I wanted to go there. And uh, of course it was impossible. That and didn't I didn't understand why it was impossible. I knew I should be there to wish my friend Queen Elizabeth well. <laughs> And um, I just remember this one incident where I was, I was just barely five and I was lying on the sofa crying and someone, some friend of my mother's came to the door and I just remember my mother saying in this totally confused, long-suffering voice, my daughter is crying because she can't attend the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. And uh, I, that's always stayed with me. And I think now, oh, that poor woman, she must have wondered what to do with this totally weird <laughs> kid. And um, so uh, in time, I think I accepted that career opportunities were limited. Absolutely. Absolutely. In that regard. Well, so um, following your flirtation with being <laughs> a queen, um, you told me that as a child, you did really enjoy art. You liked to draw um, yes. and you liked to paint. Yes. Um, as many kids do, but you really had a very personal connection with it. Yes. But interestingly, you moved away from that. What happened? Well, I think quite a few things um, happened. In some ways, my uh, dad, who was a commercial artist, as they were called then, was able to teach me some things and was encouraging, but he was a very precise person. So when I would just go in, as kids do, and just kind of mix it up, um, then sometimes he could become critical. And I think that was difficult for me. But I kept, I kept making art, and I remember in early grade school, the other kids liked to have my pictures. Um, nice. But one day, uh, our very young teacher, now I know she was very young, and um, she had probably been told that this was the era of Sputnik and we all needed to be really good at math and science and we all needed to be well-rounded. And um, she said in front of the class that I drew too much. And I remember, I was a very sensitive child, just being devastated by that. And so that was difficult. Mm -hmm. And um, at the same time, though, uh, I was really shy. And one of the things that 
helped me to get over my shyness was taking creative drama lessons and then moving into studying drama and being in a lot of local plays. And so that became another passion of mine. Um, I don't really think art and drama are too unconnected. They all have to do with imagination and um, creativity. But uh, for a while I went uh, definitely in the direction of, of acting. I remember taking art in the eighth grade and I got a C because I couldn't draw an accurate floor plan and I uh, still couldn't to save my life. So uh, at that point I thought, okay, I'm just gonna stick with the theater because I'm obviously no good at art. And um, then I, you know, I grew up, I went to college, uh, I had kids, um, I became a counselor. And over the years I tried different kinds of crafts, but a lot of those required precision and so they were kind of frustrating for me. Right. And, um, <sighs> It was until the early 90s that I started doing some kind of tentative painting with fabric paint on muslin mm -hmm. and making pillows out of them. And then there was something that you did also in yes. the 90s that I like to refer to as the inciting incident <laughs> right. for reigniting your passion right. in art. And what right. was that? Um, I took my first trip to Italy and uh, in the mid 90s and at that point everything just kind of blew open for me. I was blown away by all the incredible art that I saw in various parts of Italy. Uh, the light was something I'd never seen before. The light mm -hmm. just made everything so beautiful and sparkling and I loved the um, age of the buildings and uh, uh, the uh, streets and just loved the way things were crumbling and you could see these layers and layers of paint and paper on buildings. You could see these old frescoes that looked all the more beautiful for being crumbling mm -hmm. away. And I just, I just, it was really uh, probably the most dramatic thing that's ever happened to me. And I came home and decided I was going to teach myself to make art. And I studied by uh, looking at all of my favorite painters. I was doing uh, more uh, portrait and more representative work at that time. Mm -hmm. And I just studied everything I could to see how did they do that and what colors are they using. And I read and read and looked at art and uh, I studied uh, art history, which had always been a minor interest of mine, but I kind of threw myself into it. So I learned a lot about different artists and the different movements and what spoke to me. Sounds like a great way to go about it. Um, to rewind just a little bit sure. to some of your experience in Italy, you said that some of the things that really interested you were were the light and the yes. buildings and yes. the frescoes and even then you started to see some of the issues of decay and aging. Right. Right. Did you have any idea at that point in time that that was Wabi Sabi or No, I never heard was? of Wabi Sabi. So that came that much time. later. That came a lot later. Okay. Yeah, but I did notice those things and I noticed the so you've way always had the attraction to yes. them. Yes, yes, I've always liked things that were aged and seasoned and I've always liked the way uh, you can see nature begin to reclaim uh, mm -hmm. human-built spaces. And so I was seeing Wabi Sabi even though I didn't know what to call it. Great. Um, to switch gears a little bit, I was wondering, I know this is a tough question and anyone who has read your book will see that it will probably be tough for you to answer, but like what are some of your favorite media to work with? Okay, you're right, it's a tough question <laughs> because um, I Starting so late in life, comparatively, I um, have a little bit of the kid in the candy shop syndrome and like to try a lot of different media. Um, one thing I don't particularly work in is watercolor because okay. that does take a more uh, painstaking approach. More and precision. I, more precision, and I like things that I can do over and rip off and build up. So. Um, I would say that right now uh, my favorites are encaustic, the hot wax, and also cold wax, which you work with with oil, and you do a lot of experimenting and texturing and shaping and playing. So I'm really, really enjoying that. Great. And um, another question I have concerning actual the actual practice of making art. 
We've talked a lot both in the book and the DVDs about building up layers and just taking an intuitive approach mm -hmm. to making art. Mm -hmm. Like just add until you're comfortable with it, until you like what you see. How can I or someone else, how can anyone really know or have a sense of when a piece of art is finished? Do you have any advice for That's us on that? That's always a good question. Sometimes I, I think you just know, you just have this feeling inside you where it's uh, the piece is just speaking to you and you're speaking back to it and there's this kind of interchange and it's uh, sometimes kind of an emotional feeling and you just know you're finished. Other times it's not as clear and um, I have some people that I'm close to who are uh, they're people whose opinion I really value and they have a similar aesthetic. So sometimes I'll think something's finished but I'm not quite sure and uh, maybe I'll ask one of them and my favorite words are, to hear are, don't touch it! <laughs> and then I know not to touch it because it's really easy to overwork something. I agree. I and then agree. you have to kind of tear down and, and start again, which is okay. Right. But, but um, another thing that I do that I also uh, do with my students I, that I think is an important part of the process is that at uh, certain periods you prop your work up and you go sit across the room from it depending on how big it is, closer mm -hmm. or farther. But you just kind of have a cup of tea and you just kind of look at it. And after a while you get kind of an intuitive sense if it looks like it needs to go in a certain direction or if it's getting close to being finished. And um, sometimes something will just need a little sweet spot of something. So adding some little uh, contrasting color at random will, will finish it. And what are you working on in your studio at home right now? Well, right now I'm in the middle of a cold wax and oil obsession. So, um, and I recently had a show of work in cold wax. So uh, I'm continuing to do that. And um, that's a process which is very slow to, to dry. Okay. Uh, so when you build up the layers, there's a lot of time in between. So I usually work on several at once. And that's fun too, because it keeps me from obsessing about one piece. Mm -hmm. I just have to know, okay, stop that for now and move on to the next one. But this is very intuitive. Um, I'm not trying to usually go for a particular image or effect or even color. Um, I just keep going. It's more of a, of a matter of discovering when it's finished. Right. And sometimes you can work and work and get nowhere and then come back the next day and work for five minutes and it's done. So it, it's, uh, it's very exciting that way. And speaking of your studio, of course, you do live in Portland, Oregon. I do. Which is someplace I was lucky enough to go on a vacation last year. And um, Portland has a reputation for being artsy and funky and unique and uh, all those kind of fun adjectives. Uh, can you tell us about any places in your hometown in particular that you like to go to for Wabi Sabi inspiration? Well, um... I often go just around my neighborhood just as almost a challenge to myself to say, okay, you walk this way up to the coffee shop a million times, what can you see that you haven't seen before? What can you look at like we did in our Wabi Sabi walk Absolutely. in one of the videos? What, what can you see with new eyes? But Portland does have a lot of uh, greenery and nature. We, we have a wonderful uh, set of parks, so that's a good place to look for things um, such as the interaction between a uh, uh, human-made structure and the natural world. Um, we, for a wabi-sabi feeling, we have wonderful Japanese gardens which mm -hmm. have a, a very, um, they, they offer a really strong sense of serenity and peace and so that's inspiring. And not too far from my house we have an antique mall and sometimes oh. I go there for inspiration and also uh, just to restore my spirits and I, I like to look at all the old items that were once used and loved by people and look at how the paint is peeling and look at how it's changed over time and see what kind of a feeling I get from it. I like to do that also so I like yeah. to hear that. I'm always excited yeah. to hear from other people who have those kind of interests. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
Well, Serena, I don't want to keep you much longer. So the last question I had for you is I wanted to know that teacher back in elementary <laughs> school, what <laughs> do you think that. she would say to see you today? Well, I think she'd be very happy for me. Actually, I was uh, several years ago, I was on a local art show where they featured me and my work. And she was so excited when she saw it that she wrote me a very sweet handwritten letter. And we did get in touch, so I've seen her really? since then. And uh, she was only 23 years old, and it was her first wow. year of teaching. So I've totally forgiven her for telling <laughs> me that I drew too much. And I, I certainly would never remind her of that. And, uh, <laughs> Unless, of course, she sees this. Yeah, but well, I hope she, think she won't. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I think she'd say good for you. I'm really proud of you. Excellent. Well, I am too. Thank you. And uh, I wanted to thank once again Serena Barton, author of Wabi Sabi Art Workshop, for joining us this week. Keep an eye out for her book if you haven't checked that out already, and her two DVDs, which will be coming your way soon. Thanks. Yay!